The reason I've gone this route is because <clears throat> although many of us know hunger, we don't know hunger. In, a, in other words, we don't know the signs of being hungry. And we blame everything but the hunger. And so I, I want to take some time and just go through it. Because I think you're going to come across a lot of people that are hungry and don't know it. And they're taking, they're blaming everything else. They're blaming each other. They're blaming their pastor. They're blaming the worship leader. But the real issue is they're hungry. And they're spiritually starving. Some of them are eating. They go over Sunday and eat cake. And they're saying, what's wrong? And, and the thing that's wrong is God has put something in there that won't be satisfied. So blame it on God. Stop blaming everybody else. <laughs> so we want to define hunger. And I, I just let me tell you how this, this uh, message got started. Years ago, I was starting a work in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. And... Uh, I didn't have a vehicle, and so we the fell up the road from where we live. We live 45 miles from the church, and he had a shop, and he had a car. He said, now, if you get under there and fix it, I'll approve it and give it the safety, and you can go. Well, I am not a mechanic of any stripe or color. What it would have taken him two hours took me a full day, and I was supposed to be at at the meeting that night, we were having a home fellowship like this, except we'd moved into a schoolroom because there were about 70 people coming. But we had it on weeknights, and we tried to make it so it didn't conflict with uh, the churches that were involved, uh, you know, the people involved. And so I got home at 7.30. My wife said, you're not going because they're supposed to start at 7.30. I said, yes, I am. The Lord said, I have to go. So I ran in, I got a shower, and I was back down by about 10 to 8. And I got in the car, and I began to drive, and it wouldn't drive below 70. I said, Lord, you take care of the cops, I'll steer. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get stopped. I got there about quarter to nine, and some folks were outside, and they said, Bill, it's bad in there. I said, what's wrong? They said they're talk, they've been talking about demons since 7.30. And of course, how many have seen the field of dreams? If you build it, he will come. Mm -hmm. Well, if you talk about demons, guess what? They come too. And so I have an accordion. It's out in the car, but I had an accordion. I set it down outside the door. I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, go in, sing three songs, and minister on this scripture. I didn't know this scripture. Okay? But I'm brave enough just to step out and either sink or swim, one or the other. And so here's what it says. Uh, by the way, I walked in. I sang three songs. When I opened the door and walked in with my accordion on, if looks could have killed, Pastor would have been dead. <laughs> because the lady who was conducting the discussion was always into the supernatural and it didn't matter which side of the supernatural it was uh, I've got some stories about her but we'll leave that till later anyway I walked in we sang three songs God cleared the room the presence of God came and I ministered on this scripture Proverbs 18 and 1 through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom here the Lord defines desire as hunger Hunger is a motivator. Just try and fast and see what type of motivator hunger is. And how upset you get, especially around day three, when you're crossing over the threshold. That threshold of three days, usually hunger begins to fade after day three. But day three is a killer. And you are motivated. Don't let anybody get in your way. Don't let anybody get on your nerves. They'll find out that you are motivated. And so when I begin to say, God, okay, this scripture is not what it sounds like. Because 
and I, he said, okay, go down and define it. Go through it and, and, and see what it says. Here is the word used for hunger in, in the original. Now, it's a primary root to break through, that is, sp or no, this is for separate, to break through or spread or separate oneself. Now, notice that in the scriptures says, separates himself. Nobody else separates you from. Your hunger separates you from others. Now, as a pastor, I used to go to these pastors' meetings, and they would talk about how many they had in church, and their Sunday school size, and what their building project was. I wanted to talk about the Word. I was hungry. I didn't want just what I was getting. I wanted to know what others were getting, but they were so caught up at the setting of the table that they forgot to put the food on. And pastors often do them. T.D. Jakes said it this way one. He said, pastors die in the kitchen preparing food for everyone else. And that is often the case. Hunger will separate you from others. It will cause them not to understand you. It will cause you not to understand you. Because you're doing all the right spiritual calisthenics. You know what I mean by spiritual calisthenics? Read your Bible, pray every day. <laughs> and you'll grow. And sometimes you read your Bible, you pray every day, and you don't grow. And you are mad. And that's not a bad reaction. But sometimes God will not answer because you're not hungry enough. Proverbs says this, To the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. How many have been through bitter experiences? Just really love to go through those. No? And yet on the other side, when God had walked you all the way through, it was sweet on the other side. And so your hunger will separate you from others. It will separate you sometimes from your pastor, from the church, from the worship leader, from your friends. And you won't know it's hunger. You just know that something isn't right. Then the word seeking here is a positive. Scripture says very clearly, seek and ye shall find, to search out. In, a, in other words, most churches today on Easter, Easter Sunday morning or Saturday before Easter, all the kids come together and what do they search for? Eggs. We know one church that they dropped the eggs from a helicopter. Why? Because it brought the kids. But they don't just lay out there. You have to search for them. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Then what? Oh, but there's more work to seeking. In other words, Isaiah tells us that, that he's a God that hides himself. God plays hide and seek. Well, we won't go there right now. <laughs> But he does. He hides himself because when we seek him with all our heart, he says we'll, we, he will allow himself to be found. How many know that if God's hiding, you ain't going to find him unless he lets you? Okay? And so God hides himself in darkness. How do I know? Well, he hid himself in me. Were you in darkness when he came in? And there are some days when people really say he's hiding in you because you don't act like you ought to. <laughs> but he doesn't leave, thank God. He just hides. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes when we're looking for him in others, he hides. He is a God that hides himself. Why? Because he wants to draw out something out of you that he knows is there, but you don't. Proverbs also says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the honor of kings to search out the matter. So how do I prove I'm king material? 
I begin to search. And search is an, is an attitude that comes out of hunger. Ever be hungry for something, go to the fridge and don't find it? Then go to the cupboards and don't find it? Then go to the store and don't find it? <laughs> or, we're getting there. Yeah, we're going to get there. Okay? So, God is wanting a people who will seek Him. We have been asking, and many things we've asked for, God's given us, and we've rejoiced in that, but then you come to a wall. How come I'm not growing? How, how come things aren't going any further? What, what's going on? And you get frustrated. That is hunger. And it's because God is trying to dr draw you into a deeper place. And we're going to use some illustrations a little further on. Intermedleth. How many like that word? <laughs> Normally, we would think that that is a negative word. But in the context of this, again, it is a positive where we begin to turn over things and we begin to get stubborn. Oh, no, our, our determination gets sanctified. Okay? But, but there's that in us that, that just is not satisfied. And we, and we don't know what we're looking for. And we get, we get determined to press on through and find out why am I feeling this way and after we've blamed everybody else and that hasn't worked then we say God what's really going on wisdom wisdom in scripture is always a positive that's what clued me in on the word intermedleth is not a negative by the way gals wisdom is a she in scripture not a he isn't it interesting? The men want all the things that are women's prerogative. Oh, well, we won't go there either. All right. You can, I can if I want. Yeah, but I, I want to get through the message and not get stuck along the way. <laughs> One of the things we want to do also is stir up hunger. Okay. So, <clears throat> wisdom is from an unused a root word meaning to substantiate support or by implication to help direct to, and it's an intellectual understanding with a practical application many have intellectual understanding they have academic skills that are beyond what most of us would have but when they try to apply something it doesn't work because there's a disconnect and in Christianity today, there's a disconnect between our theology and our daily walk. We have not been taught how to apply this principle or whatever we're looking at. And so, again, we feel frustrated. But that is a hunger for an application that works and will change things. I mean, like you as you is. Okay. We need to change. Oh. Now there, what was that? Well, <laughs> that, 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 that may be relative, <laughs> you know. All right, but, but let's, <clears throat> when, when God laid out the patterns from heaven, he gave them to Moses in the tabernacle. They were enlarged on in the temple. And in these three dimensions that the temple and the tabernacle speak of, there are three dimensions of relating to God. And God's heart is that we come into the most holy place. Okay? And he is drawing us. He is speaking to us. He's calling to us. God speaks from off the mercy seat. Number one, if you hear a message that doesn't have mercy in it, it's not God. If God speaks from off the mercy seat, then everything he says is pregnant with mercy. Mercy brings life. Sympathy brings death. But mercy brings life. So in the levels of hunger, we start in Song of Solomon, chapter 1 and verse 3. And Song of Solomon is all about a hungry lady. 
and the young man courting her. Okay? Here's what she says. Now, if you look at Song of Solomon, you'll realize this. Number one, she is not just saved. She is functioning in all the gifts of the Spirit. She is in ministry because she has sheep. I may know that if you have sheep, you're usually a shepherd or a shepherdess, which would knock some of the doctrine today about women in ministry, but we won't go there this time. <laughs> she says, after having functioned in ministry, had a relation, a level of relationship with Jesus, she says, draw me and we will run after thee. That run is speaking of spirit, soul, and body. My whole being will pursue. And she goes on to say, and, and we'll look at this in a bit too, but she goes on to say, because of your kisses, the virgins love you. In other words, there's a level of intimate relationship, but she's not satisfied. She's functioned in the gifts. She's functioned in ministry, but she's not satisfied. So if you have functioned anywhere in God and you're still not satisfied, that's okay. It's not wrong to be hungry. Okay? Then in the second, which is equivalent to the holy place, in Song of Solomon chapter 3, she says, By night on my bed... I sought him. Now, usually we go to bed and go to sleep. But there comes a point in hunger where you can't even sleep. And God is wanting to bring a people there. She was so aware of him that even in her sleep, when he called, something inside responded. Now, to me, that's something. Then in <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 4, she says, My bowels. Now, no, I better not go there. Bill, behave yourself. It's the first time here. Uh, <laughs> My bowels were moved for him. She didn't have a bowel movement. All right, we got that out of the way. <laughs> I'm just me. <laughs> but something inside stirred because of the hunger. And it was hunger for relationship, not hunger for things. Much of the church is focused on the stuff. And the people are not happy. They go and worship and they get a certain point and then it's cut off. And something and says, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. I'm old enough to have been in some of the amazing moves of God. And I have seen services where the Holy Spirit literally took over. And churches where the Holy Spirit literally took over. You'd come in at service time and the Spirit of God just slay you right out. No worship, no preaching, just power of God moving and flowing, changing lives. No altar call, people running to the altar to be saved. Well, God would have to really interfere in some of our churches to get there, wouldn't he? Because we have taken the spirit of the world which is tied to the clock. God moves from eternity. He's going to take his time. <laughs> and some of that is just to weed out those who don't want to go where God's going. I remember in, in my younger days, we would have service, and it, it would go on for a while. But after service... Some of the old timers would get up around the altar, sit on the, that time we had altar uh, things where they knelt. They'd sit on the altar and they'd begin to sing. The presence of God would come. People would be baptized in the Spirit without even knowing what was going on. 
lives would be changed, deliverance would come, no one would lay hands on them because the power of God came. But it was after all the onlookers left. And some of the stuff, God waits to see how hungry we are. It's not He's not being mean. He's just, he, you know, worshiping God is not a spectator sport. And sometimes he has to get all the spectators out of the way so you will feel free enough to release your hunger. Now, here's some indications of hunger. Desire for more, even though people are telling you there is no more. That's How many know that sets up a conflict inside? Yeah. Well, you've got this, you've got this. You've, there isn't any more. Enjoy what you got. Yeah, but something in here says... There's more. Do I believe you? Because you don't look happy. <laughs> or do I believe what's going on in here? Inward agitation. None of you have ever had that? Frustration. We've been told it's rebellion to be frustrated when the frustration often comes from hunger. Just in the natural, just try fasting and see if you don't get easily frustrated. Well, if that's so in the natural, how much more in the spiritual? Feeling agitated without any external stimulus. In other words, your children aren't getting on your nerves. It's an agitate. Nobody's around and you're agitated. And you rebuke the devil and nothing happens. Because it isn't the devil. It's an internal hunger that's rising up for more of God. Somewhere inside, there's a cry for more. You come to a place where worship doesn't satisfy. You listen to the word and it doesn't satisfy. Prayer doesn't seem to work either. I mean, how many hear desperation coming? I've tried all the calisthenics and nothing is working. And all of these, and there are many more indications of spiritual hunger. And what I'm seeing wherever we go is groups like this, home groups, rising up. Not They aren't leaving their churches, but they aren't getting what they need, fully need in their churches. Now, one thing, churches get too big. Come on. Churches get too big. And you couldn't get to the pastor for a week or two, maybe longer. Not because he doesn't want to meet with you, but because only the pastor can answer my problems. <laughs> well, God's getting ready to settle that. God's getting ready to give answers to people who most folks don't expect. God is stirring up some things in this. Do as you're told. Uh, he didn't say you didn't heal the sick. He didn't say you didn't cast out devils. He didn't say you didn't prophesy. But you didn't know me in them. Every gifting of the Spirit, every ministry of the Spirit is a vehicle to teach me him. God uses me in ministry because I can learn of Him. And many function in ministry and never learn of Him. That took me a while to learn that. A while of functioning. And I began to realize, wait a minute. I, don't, I, I, I really personally experienced this Song of Solomon in this area. I was not satisfied. And I especially was not satisfied when I prayed for the sick and they died. Uh, and, and, and what that was, was, listen, sometimes God will frustrate your way. Because if things worked for you, you'd stop at that level and not grow anymore. It's not God being mean, honest. It's God saying, I love you too much to let you settle where you are. Now, 
the scripture that came to me this afternoon as I was looking at this was Psalm 34, verse 8, where she says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God loves when we come to him and worship. The Psalm 2 says, kiss the son. You know, that word in the original means worship. When we worship, we enter into a realm of intimacy that can be gained no other way. And so the next time we get together and there's someone that can play an instrument, try some kissing. All right. <laughs> Then she goes on to say, draw me. That is a prayer. Now, I know Scripture says no man can come unto, the, uh, unto Jesus unless the Father draw him. But we also need to pray, draw me. And we, spirit, soul, and body, will run after thee. The king brought me into his chambers. Now, in this scenario, the king is the church. It's not the Lord himself. The Lord himself is a shepherd in this scenario. The king brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. There is a love relationship that's already started, but it's not intense enough. You know, we have a young lady living with us, and, and she has a boyfriend. And she wants to spend her time with him for some reason. <laughs> and in one way, they don't spend enough time together. We're looking at one another and say, when's she going to get her homework done? Going to get her homework done. <laughs> so let's look at the wooing of the bridegroom or what the, sh the shepherd now, she has spoken where she's at. Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 10. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. By the way, God's always calling you out of your boxes. She gets comfortable. He says, rise up. He's always on the outside calling you outside of your box. Humanity loves boxes. Maybe that's why they bury us in the coffin. I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Humanity loves boxes. We like to have everything pigeonholed. We like to know what's going to happen today, tomorrow, and next week. And God says, let me take you outside of that. Okay? And the second one in the Song of Solomon level, he, he says, come with me. Remember that when we come into, if we're making this journey in the tabernacle, when we come into the holy place, it's no longer minister to the people. It's minister to the Lord. And many never get out of the outer court. They minister to the house. They minister to the people. And thank God for them. They get people saved and baptized in the Spirit. But they never minister unto the Lord. And God, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, the Levite could never enter into the holy place. It had to be one of the sons of Aaron, one of that descendant line. But in God, we start out as a Levite, and we can move into the priesthood, and then move into the high priest. In other words, we can transition into the fullness of what God has for us. We do not have to be limited, and it doesn't matter where you've been. It only matters where you're going. That's the beautiful thing about God. He didn't look at me and say, well, you've done this in the past and this in the past, and you messed up here, so you can't go there. He says, oh, you messed up? That, what is it? Um, one of those HGTV, I think it's Flip the Houses, they say the worse the mess, the, hmm? The worse... The, yeah, the, it was a fixer upper. Yep. Yeah. See, and, see, we all move in the same flow. But, <laughs> but, but hear me. If you have been terribly messed up, God is saying you're a trophy of grace. You are called to be set on display of the grace of God. 
He said that now might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now the church has nothing to do with the, where you meet down the street. The church has to do with this is the church. We are the church. Each time we gather, we're the church. And he says by us, he wants to display the wisdom of God. How God can take a mess and as one person said, make it a message. He can take a test and give you a testimony. By the way, there's no testimony if there's no test. Did I hear a loud amen somewhere? <laughs> and the holiest of all, he says, come my beloved, let us go forth. We labor for God in the outer court. We labor with him in the holy place. Or labor for him in the holy place. But we labor with him in the holiest of all. Come now, let us go forth. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 11. Act of invitations of the voice. It says, the voice of my beloved. The voice of my beloved. The voice. How many know that the voice came walking in the cool of the day? Back in the Garden of Eden. When I wrote the course on the voice of God, I got a pair of combat boots, found me a heart, and put the heart, uh, the combat boots on the heart, and said the voice, or no, a pair of lips, and put the heart, uh, put the lips on the combat boots, and said the voice of God came walking. All right. <laughs> now, the voice of my beloved. Lo, he comes leaping upon the mountain and skipping on the hills. Again, he wants to bring us outside, not only of our boxes, but of our rigidity. And dare I go here? Our problem in the church is we are too stuffy. How many remember the story of David? when they brought the ark back to Jerusalem. Did you ever look up the word of what he was doing? He was leaping and twirling. He looked like an idiot. <laughs> it's time we got to be idiots in church. <laughs> Most places won't allow idiots. <laughs> they won't allow that freedom that God wants to bring inside. That's why I think he's talking first about leaping. Getting your freedom back. Your ability to worship God with abandonment. To get out of your personal box. That's why I believe he calls her out first. Before he calls her in. He's got to get me free enough first to be willing to obey. Then he can take me somewhere. Then he can do something with me. Then I'll be more attached to him because when we're out there playing together, how many know that you bond when you play together? Hmm. It's time you weren't playing with Jesus. Second of all, the voice of my beloved knocketh open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. Oh, you mean I've got my doors closed? He doesn't have free access. I'm shut up within myself. None of you are, but I am. All right. And then, Again, when he takes her into, when she comes into the holiest of all, he says, let us go, go up early to the vineyards and the, and the pomegranates, and there will I give you my loves. Wait a minute. There's been love all the way through the Song of Solomon. This is chapter 7, verse 12, and there are only eight, eight chapters. What do you mean? I mean there's a depth of love that I can only give to you when I can invite you to work beside me in me, for me. He is withholding a level of love on purpose. Not because he doesn't love you, but because the bonding that gets you to that place is essential. 
and walking through this, obviously I don't have time to teach the whole book, but walking through this, she is inviting him, or he is inviting her deeper and deeper and deeper in the relationship until the identification is almost. So in the outer court, just from the wording of the passage used, we get the impression that the voice is unrestrained, inviting her to a place outside the confines of her personal world. Now only you know the confines of your personal world. And some of us aren't too willing to see all the borders. But we all have a personal world, and he's going to, I guarantee, he'll invite you outside where you don't feel comfortable. He'll invite you to do something you don't feel comfortable doing. Why? Because he's trying to break down some things in you that you've built up that make you you. I'm dignified. I want you to know I'm a wise man. He says, oh, let me cause you to do something foolish so that pride gets dealt with. <laughs> now it's seen expressing a bounding joy shown by the leaping, leaping upon the mountains and skipping on the hills. How many as adults leap and skip? Do those kids? <laughs> Bless her, Lord. <laughs> but those kids don't have any problem doing it, do they? Except you become as little children. Okay? So, you know, this afternoon when I was looking at this, I really felt the Lord say, I want to play with you first. Before I take you any further, I want to play with you. How many know that you don't really hear that in most of our religious circles? Let's go play with Jesus! And yet, done that, leaping up on the mountain, skipping on, isn't that childish activity? If he can become as a little children, a little child, possibly it's he might be able to help us get there. Okay. Second of all, the holy place, the intensity and level of the voice's effect on her has deepened. It's reaching inside now. It's not just an earful. Something inside is responding almost in spite of her. Have you ever been in a service where something's going on inside in spite of the attitude you came with? And you really don't want God to get through to you because you'd rather stay in your funk. <laughs> This causes an involuntary response when heard even though she is asleep. Her heart has been captured so that it responds in spite of her unconscious condition of sleep. But yet the call is still to come away from that level of relationship to not rest in this dimension of love because there is more. The great thing about God is he's deep. You know something? You're made in his image. Guess what? You are as deep as he is. Let that sink in. Because he said deep calls unto the deep of you calls to the deep of God. We don't have a real problem with that. But when the deep of God calls to the deep of us, we have a problem with that. God says you're made in his image. God says you're deep. So stop, no calling one another shallow anymore. In the holiest of all, this time the voice speaks as to an equal, inviting her into the harvest within the church, the vineyard and the orchard. Now remember, Jesus didn't say, I'm going to make you... Uh, care of a vineyard. He didn't say I'm going to make you take care of an orchard. He said I'll make you fishers of men. And so here's what's happened in the church. We only have one harvest we think of. What is it? Saving souls. But how many know that sheep bear lambs? All we like sheep 
That's not a bad joke either. All right. <laughs> See, we, we, we have been programmed to think only of fishing. And in North America, we don't even fish right. We put a hook in and line in. And they fished by net. But see, it's easier to fish with a line because I don't have to cooperate with you. Because you see, a net is made up of knots, isn't it? Not N-O-T-S, K-N-O-T-S. And what is a knot? What? It often is two pieces tied together. And a knot is many pieces tied together. That means if we're going to go fishing like Jesus said we're supposed to, we're going to use a net. And that's a corporate thing. And I get along well with myself, but, you know, Jesus, you and I have a great time together. But the body of Christ, that's, that's another matter. And God is getting ready to make some nets. And the relationships he's going to put together may not all be in the same church. God wants to make nets in the local churches, but how many know nets go where the fishes are? Most fish in the church are cleaned already. <laughs> Caught and cleaned. <laughs> you do that to scale, but anyway. All right. <laughs> The vineyard is clear because of the mention of grapes testing their tenderness. He says, let us go into the vineyard. Well, what's the vineyard speak of? Doesn't it speak of, I, he said, I am the vine? Oh, you mean they're not sinners? That's a great thought. All right. That was bad. I know. What can I say? Now, he didn't say that the harvest was ready. He said, let's see if it's ready. He would like us ready before the harvest. But that's only come, going to come through the relationship. And I learn his heart towards the harvest. It does not necessarily mean the harvest is ready, but she's ready to work in the harvest. Do you realize you're in a time of preparation? that there is a harvest coming. And what he's working on now is getting the harvester ready. And that's us. Now we know that the harvest may not be ready because he said, let us see if the tender grapes appear. The orchard is clear because it's where the pomegranates are found. It is the seed of the pomegranate that's eaten. This suggests there's a gathering of seeds of truth to be done at this time. Often what we do when we share and minister, we just give you seeds. You ever gone home from a minute? I wish he'd have said more about that. I wish he'd have said more about that. All they gave you was the seed. But you should be encouraged by that. That means you're a good garden. That you have within you the ability to grow the seed that's been planted. See, God planted a garden eastward in Eden. You are the garden of God. And God doesn't believe in cloning things. So he's planting, he's collecting seed to plant. What are the responses to the ecstasy of his presence? Here's what she says. Don't stir him up or awake my love till he please. Now here's what happens. She got so comfortable in his presence, he left and she didn't know it. We need to think about that. I know a place where they had awesome worship, but they were stuck in worship for 10 years. Because 
They worship worship rather than the person of Jesus. And of course, if you worship him, guess what? He will come. To the level I pour out to him, to that level he comes back. But I've come to the place where I love the word, I love worship, but I want the person. Because I don't want to hear, depart from me, I never had a relationship with you. Okay? So she says, don't wake him up. Let him sleep. And obviously she went to sleep because the next time, next thing you hear is, arise, my love. My. By the way, humans have tendencies. And one of the tendencies is to get comfortable where they're at. I mean, love to move. In our marriage, we have moved every two and a half years. <laughs> I knew you didn't know what you were saying. <laughs> and <coughs> one of those moves, we moved from Atlanta to, to Pennsylvania. And we didn't know it at the time until we went to move, but there was black mold in the house. And of course, she's susceptible to black mold. And she would get sick, and we wouldn't know what it was. We'd take her to the doctor. They'd do the breathing treatments. We'd come back. And, well, that night, what was it? Within a couple of hours, I had to get her out of the house. And I was packing. I had to finish packing the house by myself. I still haven't found some stuff. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but... We have a tendency, it's a tendency in humans, to settle. There's an advertisement on TV, you've probably seen it. Can we get direct TV? No, we're settlers. <laughs> we settle for, for less than the best. And God is, this is terrible, God is direct TV. <laughs> He's the best. And what he wants to do is to bring us into the best. But we are settlers by nature. In God, there are three groups. There are settlers, there are pioneers, and there are explorers. Explorers go where others may have been, but the explorers map it. You realize that Joshua and Caleb were explorers when they went into the promised land? And so were the other ten. But the other ten didn't see the potential and believed the negative. So they didn't map the land. When they went, 40 years later, when they, they sent two spies into the land. And I said, God, why only two? The last time they sent 12. He said, because the land was already mapped out. They just need to see if anything had changed. And so God is calling a people today to go where no man has gone before. Only Jesus has been there. He mapped it out. And he said, follow me and I will make you. Now you can add fishers of men. You can add whatever call is on your life. But he must make you that. And he doesn't use methods like we're used to. Okay, God is not a Methodist. He didn't go there. Okay, so she gets comfortable. He leaves. And then he comes again. She has, she, again, this time also she brought him, it says, she brought him to her mother's house. Do you know where mother is? In God, mother's the church you were born in. Or you came to Jesus. And we like mother. And you should like mother. But there comes a time, for this reason shall a man, what's the rest of it? Oh, leave father and mother and be cleaved to his wife. Okay? Now, some of our mother-in-law problems are exactly that. Either the children have not left and cleft, <laughs> or the in-laws have not let go. And when that happens, it causes problems. 
Here she brings it back to mother's house and she says the same thing again. I pr don't want you to stir up nor awake my love till he please. And guess what? She goes to sleep and he leaves and she doesn't know it till she hears his voice again. That's a pattern. It's no, it's no shame to fall asleep. When you wake up, what are you going to do? By the way, sleep is normal. How many recognize that sleep is normal? The parable of the of the ten virgins. How many slumbered and slept? They all slumbered and slept. It's what happens when you wake up that's important. It's what you did before you went to sleep. The wise ones had said, we're going to bring some extra oil along. In other words, when the Holy Spirit was moving and flowing, they learned how to store up some. Hmm. How do I store up some? When I'm in a service where the Spirit of God is moving, how do I store some of that up for later? Well, I'll let you ask God that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll learn that when you come and I'm speaking, you bring a big seed bucket. <laughs> and even at the end, she said, that you stir him not up nor awake my love till he please. But this time, she is in a totally different place. She is now aware. Even though she too may sleep, when he wakes, guess what? She wakes. Okay? So, how will you respond? This is God's challenge. And I believe it's a challenge for us because there's something stirring, not just in one or two groups, but across the face of the nation and the other, in, and in Canada as well. And I'm pretty sure it's across the other nations, although I haven't been to the nations for a while. There's a hunger going out. And God is challenging a people to do something about it. Instead of just saying, I'm hungry, and going to the spiritual McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Where all, I call McDonald's the filler station. All you get is filler. <laughs> you don't get any nutrition. You just get filler. Yeah, I like some of their filler, but I realize I'm, you know, it's going to sit there for a week or so inside before it moves. But anyway, we won't go there. You will never look at Mickey D's the same. Right. <laughs> Some are in the outer court and are hearing him call to them, come outside your boxes. And folks, we all have boxes. We all have boxes. We have personal boxes. There are personal traditions that we have in our relationship with God that we don't know until he puts his finger on them. I remember when God was trying to get me out of the demon uh, the denomination I was in. Uh, <clears throat> by the way, that word demonation, I coined it from Richard Wombrandt. It's not mine. <clears throat> when he, he spent 13 years in communist prisons, three years in solitary confinement. And the Anglican Church, or the Episcopal Church in England, bought him. They went to the Romanian government, and they offered them $10,000 to buy Richard Wombrandt out of prison. And so, by the way, after that, the press Christians were up uh, <laughs> when they realized they could make money on him. But when he got to London, he got off the plane, and he, speak, he spoke 14 languages. He read and wrote and spoke 14 languages. And so English was not his first language. But he got off the plane, and someone said to him, what denomination? do you belong to? And he thought they said, what demonation do you belong to? And he, every, he used that ever afterwards. But when God began to try and bring me out of the, the denomination, it's, it's like this, okay? He brought Israel out of Egypt. That was not difficult. It took him 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. 
And when I was saying, God, I don't have any traditions, boy, was I. I had traditions, but do you know how I got them? Not because they'd been preached from the pulpit, but because I had been in a society that had prayer in the schools. We had Bible reading in school. Every uh, assembly, we had an assembly once a week, and every assembly they sang hymns. I got it by osmosis. You know, I was immersed in what they called a Christian society. Consequently, some of the stuff I got by osmosis. And that's what we do. Those are the things that are more difficult to get to. Because we don't even know they're there. We don't know why we're doing them. We've always done them this way. And so God is going to begin to say, you've got this box. I want you to come outside it. I want you to learn to play with me. Oh no, Jesus. You're God the Father. We can't do that. Do you realize that he stopped a sermon in the middle to bless kids? To him, the kids were more important than the adults. But what do we do with kids in our churches? Oh, we won't go there. All right. Second of all, some are just at the edge of the labor, hearing his voice calling them to come away with him. Now, in the tabernacle, the labor was where you washed before you went, you, you washed there, you changed your clothes because you could not wear wool in the holy place. By the way, that's where this saying, no sweat came from. Because in, <laughs> in linen, there's no sweat. <laughs> Most, well, we won't go there. All right. <laughs> but God has brought a people to the labor. There's a cry in their heart for more. And they know that what's behind them, and it's all that stuff was good. It was not the, what was done at the altar of burnt offerings was not evil. It was good. It dealt with salvation. It dealt with with peace. It dealt with many things that we need to to learn. But God does not want us to stop there. How much of the church has stopped right there? And they're busy. They're really busy. And people are getting saved, and we thank God for that. But there's a group, I guarantee, in every church that's hungry and don't know what they're hungry for. Because they've never been told there's more. Now, there's a group in the holy place hearing the invitation to enter the glory and live there. And see... That's where I have my sight. I don't know what that looks like. I don't fully know how to get there because I'm not sure it's all been revealed yet. But I don't want to be where I'm at. I am not satisfied with what I got. And so the cry of my heart is, God, there's got to be more. I don't know how to get there. I don't know what it looks like. And that's good. Do you know why? If I knew what it looked like, I'd try and get it. I wouldn't let the Holy Spirit lead me. I've got to admit, I don't know where I'm going before I can be led. That's my safety. Not knowing what I'm doing. Not knowing where I'm going. I'm a leader. Follow me. Uh, <laughs> but see, that's got to be our attitude. Here, here, here's here's what, what I've seen. And I've come through a number of, of moves of God and seen some tremendous stuff. But what often happens is instead of looking forward and looking at Jesus as the model, we look back and see that we got more than the folks behind us. When we do that, we settle. And God, you're not called to be a settler, not even in the holy place. You're called to go all the way, experience God, and then when you come out of that experience, you carry substance to whoever you go to. That's what God wants. He wants you to gain substance to give away. But that can only come the deeper you go in God. 
the more your heart cries out for the depths of God, the more you're unsatisfied and stop blaming everybody else and everything else and say, say, God, this dissatisfaction has been authored by you. And I want all you've got for me. And I'm not stopping until I get it. Remember, it says, give, give God, no, the, just stop and think about this. Give God no rest till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Wait a minute. Give God no rest? Agitate God? Frustrate him? Pound on his door? Until he make you a praise in the earth. Lord, I don't know how to agitate you. Would you teach me? <laughs> Would you? T I want to get there. You've said you're going to have a people that will show forth your praise in everything they do. I want to be one of those. And I know I looked in the mirror this morning and I ain't one yet. So something's got to change. I don't know what it is. And you said you would lead us and guide us into all truth. I'm holding you to your word. I can see some problems in my life, so I know I'm not yet in all truth or into all truth. Therefore, I still need to be led. That's not a poor me attitude. That's a hungry attitude. And he said, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, what? Shall be filled. Do you know what that means in the original? It's impossible for it not to happen. God said, if you'll hunger after me, it's impossible for you not to get what you hunger for. People may think you're shooting too high, you're asking for too much. Don't believe them. Because God said you can have it. And he hasn't lied yet. I have. And I would guarantee that you have. But he hasn't. So if he says it's possible, for me. Don't look around and say, well, I know it's possible for this one, but not for me. No, no, no. For you. Because it says he takes the beggar from the dunghill and sets him with princes. Brother Bailey was traveling in Africa one day and <clears throat> went to this tribe he'd never been to before, and they brought out a fresh cow patty. And he said, what's that? He said, that's, they, they said, that's the seat of honor. He takes the beggar from the dunghill and puts him with princes. <laughs> that's what he used. He used that to illustrate that. Now, here's the question, or the questions that we need to answer. How will you respond? How far will your hunger take you? Your hunger is the thing that's going to take you there. Not your knowledge and understanding. If it was academia, I'd have it. I don't quite have as many letters as the alphabet, but I have a few back there. Okay? But it's, it, the thing that, that really gets me is, you, you, you know, you, you listen to some of these folks and and some of these preachers, and they said, read your Bible, pray every day. What about the folks that only have one page? That's all they got. If it's knowing the Bible, they aren't going to make it. But how come? As soon as they made Jesus, they healed the sick, they raised the dead, they cast out devils. Where'd they get that? They don't even have the page of the Bible. How many know the Spirit came and led them into that truth? We need to pray against the spirit of unbelief that is over North America. And start with us. Lord, I need all unbelief taken out of me. What about these folks who are having the Muslims 
who have no access to the Bible, and Jesus appears to them in the night, and they get saved, and they begin to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. See, here's the issue. It's relationship, not head knowledge. You press into relationship. I'm not saying don't read the Word. Obviously, I do, and I study it extensively, but the answer is not in the academics or the calisthenics. The answer is in the relationship. By the way, let's deal with what I call the appointment with God issue. Many people have an appointment relationship with God. They get up in the morning and they read their Bible and they pray and they've done it for the day. That's an appointment. But how many know, now there are times when my wife thinks she does need to make an appointment with me, but <clears throat> that's, there's some days she says that too. <laughs> Guess what? We try to have an appointment. No. Uh, <laughs> but you relate to the one you love when you're with them. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't say, you're going to feel like I never leave you. Because there's some days when you think he is off in Timbuktu answering somebody else's prayer because he ain't listening to yours. But if you learn to talk with him at the moment of the problem or the moment of your question, you will build a relationship with him that will supersede any knowledge of the scripture you have. Because how many know that you can forget a few things? I was telling Greg today, I've done so much study, I can't remember where the notes are. Thank God for computers. You can type in a word and find what you're looking for. Can't do that up here. Don't worry. <laughs> are you hearing me? God wants to stir your hunger. He wants you to pray, draw me. And we will run after you. We will respond. You're going to find more and more and more hungry people wherever you go. And they may be at the basic salvation level. They may be further on. But the hunger is being the Holy Spirit and God the Father are stirring the hunger in the church. And there are those who will continue to do what they do. You know, God doesn't show up at church. It doesn't make any difference. It looks the same in many of these places. But he's stirring in every church hunger. And we need to catch that and realize that. And realize that we can be on the cutting edge of the fresh thing that God is about to do. And all it takes is not knowledge, not understanding, not gifting, not ministry, hunger. Just responding to the hunger of God. And recognizing some days when you're frustrated, it has nothing to do with the kids, with the husband, the wife, the friends. It has to do with the hunger inside. Right, sir? Okay. Do you have anything, sweetheart? No? Okay. I think we're done. <laughs>